and it looks like everyone here is people we know. Um, if you do have a question for Mary, just use one of the reactions, probably like the thumbs up, and um, we can unmute you to have you answer to have you ask your question. Um, and then if you have something else that you would like to say, feel free to use the chat box with that. Um, as always, this will be available afterwards, and we're really excited to have Mary with us today, all the way from Iceland. And um, thank you all for hopping on and joining us on this Tuesday. So we, uh, this is just going to be um, really informal for you folks, partially because I was working on a grant, and I'm like, ah, I got to get this, get this done. So. Um, I taught a course here at the Agriculture University of Iceland um, in uh, the first two months of the semester, so January and February, and I finished it up like right as COVID was hitting. Um, but I'm working on a graduate school course right now, or a graduate studies course with um, what, a graduate student here, and we're having a blast. And um, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about what I've learned about Iceland. I love this place. Um, it's great and it's really interesting, even though um, it's only like uh, we haven't gotten above 50 degrees yet. So, um, so let me just show you a little bit about Iceland. Um, this is a map of Iceland, um, a vegetative map. So I, can you see my little um, um, pointer? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, um, uh, Reykjavik is right down here. So that's where the uh, bulk of the population lives. There's about 364,000 people in Iceland. About 50,000 people are um, foreign born um, or um, non-Icelandic uh, citizens who are residing in Iceland right now. A lot of those people are Polish. Um, so there's a lot of Polish that come and work in the in the fish processing here. Um, they've they uh, Iceland is uh, in the Arctic Circle, so we are close to our midnight days. But if you see the Reykjavik's down here, this is Klafridia, which is the next fjord from where we live, and um, this is where Americans had um, their the British and the Americans had their uh, submarine base during World War II. Um, it was about, um, I'm trying to think, 80 years ago, I think, or yes, that uh, Britain uh, came and did a non, or kind of a non-offensive takeover of Iceland uh, during World War II. So Iceland has never had a military and never had, um, um, they were under Denmark for, uh, the crown of Denmark for a long time. I live in this fjord uh, up here off of um, um, Borger in the municipality of Borger, Borger uh, Build. And the second largest city is up here in Akureyri. Reykjavik has maybe in the capital area about 250,000 people or to somewhere around 60 to 70 percent of Iceland's population. Akater, on the other hand, has about 20,000. Um, and then the rest of the people are distributed. So the West Fjords of Iceland is what they call the highlands in this area. The sheep will go to the highlands during the uh, summer um, and uh, they'll round up uninhabited land. Now during when the um, when uh, the settlers came from Norway, originally around 900 AD, um, apparently it was warmer here. And there are remains of settlements in the highlands. But in general, these things are glaciers. There's glaciers over here on the Snæfellsnes. You can, this really large glacier here. So really, this is a land of fjords um, and very, very fertile soil in the fjords. So this is where all the um, um, agriculture does take place and then the highlands. Um, so this kind of gives you a little bit more. You can see where the roads are developed. Well, the roads are developed down here in the um, in Reykjavik area. And um, um, in South Iceland, this is the area of Iceland that gets a lot of tourism. Although John and I are going to start our journey around the Ring Road. Um, we're gonna go around the whole of Iceland. It's about 800 miles. 
So this population of 360,000 people um, keeps up a um, um, very incredible infrastructure. And the infrastructure is education. It's a highly educated population. Um, roads, um, healthcare, it's a, it's, a, it's a Nordic country in that sense. So this is me in my uh, newly acquired alopa peza, which essentially means wool sweater. Um, this is a pretty traditional pattern, um, and everybody wears these. These are um, not gimmicky. These are warm, and they basically adjust to your temperature. Um, so they're really good to wear when you're out doing chores or when you're out hiking, because everybody goes hiking in this country. Um, I got mine at a thrift store. I'm probably going to uh, try to get another one too, but I thought this was good for a thrift store. So let me start with how beautiful it is. I'm just gonna show you some pictures from right around where we live. So this is my office window just a few days ago. Um, this is um, Half Hafnirfjö here, um, which is the mountain that we kind of claim. Um, interesting fact, um, the sun does not come above these mountains until sometime in late January. Um, people who live right here, down here, including my friend Dagny, um, won't see the sun um, until sometime in uh, middle of February. Um, back here, these mountains, um, the Skarajeta, are about um, a thousand meters, so um, it gets pretty high. They won't totally lose their snow um, and you can see the trees haven't leafed out yet, but what a beautiful view. Um, this is also near where we live. Uh, this is Krinfasa. It's only um, about a uh, um, 30 minute drive from us. Um, this was taken in maybe February. Um, the water just flows out from the lava rocks. I forgot to mention, yeah, there's a lot of volcanoes here. And uh, we went hiking on a volcanic uh, crater, a cone. Um, not too long ago, but volcanic uh, rock and and uh, glacier melt is what gives um, Iceland kind of its vegetation. Um, so it's very rocky in lots of places. Uh, apparently when the Vikings came around 900, there were birch trees, low growing birch trees across the island, but these were denuded, used for fuel sources. And there's a program to start to say, can we reforest um, Iceland? There's a lot of work going on around restoration ecology. What should we try to reclaim? Um, how do sheep manage in that? So we'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, this is just a little falls. There's, there's falls everywhere. This is, again, it's not too far. The day that, this is my husband, John, the day we were up there uh, on those falls, which is on just another river, just a little ways from us. Um, we had been in a hot pot, or i.e. a natural hot pool, um, that uh, the Vikings converted to Christianity around 80, 1,000 in that pool called Kraslaug, and it's not um, very far from this uh, waterfall. Um, that's further down from this waterfall and looking down the valley, um, my brother says, well, it looks kind of cold and austere, but it's absolutely beautiful. Yeah, it's cold, but it never gets really cold. So it's not cold like Missouri cold. Um, it gets down, I think the lowest it's been while we've been here is around 18 degrees overnight. Um, but usually, you know, all winter it was about 20 something, between 20 and 35. And then now it's warmed up a little bit. So it doesn't get, but it doesn't get very warm. Um, but you have the hot pools, and this is called the Secret Lagoon. This is taken in February before all the pools were closed due to COVID. And uh, we were on our tour of the Golden Circle at that point. But if you can kind of see at the back, um, all of that steam, um, that's naturally heated um, pool. It may be about 35 degrees outside, and we're out there in the pool, but it's absolutely wonderful. So let's talk a little bit about that sustainability because it's related to this picture. So what um, Iceland is really known for, and according to my students um, who are very, some of my students were very critical environmentalists, 
Um, Iceland is really known for its um, its hot, or well, its geothermal heat, let's put it that way. So this, and let me see if I can play this. Um, this is just about 30 minutes from us. I'm not gonna try to pronounce it because it's pretty hard to pronounce, but it's a hot spring um, that actually provides all of our heat um, that we use here in our, um, our um, sorry, um, it provides all of our heat that we use in our um, apartments and our buildings and everything. From here, from where this originates, about 30 miles up from us, I mean, 30 minutes, so it's about maybe 30 kilometers away from us, down all the way to Akronis, which would be another 45 minutes the other direction. So you'll see large pipes laying across along the roadside, and that is this hot water being um, um, piped down to, to um, being used for heat and things like that. Okay, now, how do I get this to go to the next, how do I advance it? There we go. Um, so th this, um, this uh, uh, these hot water springs, these hot springs are all over um, Iceland. Um, the capital area, the capital city area, there's a power plant there uh, that captures the heat and it, it runs the, the heat and the, provides the heat and runs the electricity for most of Iceland. Now this next thing is a little bit out of um, order, so I'll just talk about it quickly and then uh, go on, um, because I wanted to relate the hot springs to um, the, the horticulture industry here. But first let's talk about dairy. So livestock is very important. We're gonna talk about more livestock in a little bit. Um, this is the Agriculture University's dairy barn. Um, they have about 65 head they milk, um, and it's, that's about it, um, in terms of big dairy farms. They, they don't have very many farms that are bigger than that. Um, biggest dairy farm here, which I think we drove by, um, one weekend while we were out and about, is near Flüde, um, and it, I think, has about 200 cows that they milk. Um, so we are talking about a lot of smaller farms. Now, the dairy, um, the cows are inside all, all the time. Um, the manure is spread. Um, it's stored underneath them. Of course, many of you know these kinds of systems. Um, but then they spread it right after the um, thaw has begun, but before um, they need to get in the field. So for a couple of days here, it really stank pretty bad because they were out spreading um, manure on on the school's field. Um, they have one robotic milker and so you can kind of see um, uh, down here that the um, cow goes in when she wants to get milked and uh, there were cows lined up for this um, um, wanting to be milked the day I was there. So Remember, let's go back for just a second. Remember that very powerful, I mean, you cannot, um, this will boil your hand off, right? You remember that very powerful hot springs? That's why they have a pretty well-developed um, um, horticulture industry in Iceland, which I'm sure you're thinking subarctic, and why would they have a horticulture um, uh, industry uh, and it's because of the geothermal heat. What they lack is sunlight so the geothermal then also powers the lights and you can see these lights up here. Um, this was about late January, early February, I think it was in late January when we were here. Um, the daylight in late January, this is down in the southern part so they get maybe about 45 minutes more sunlight, an hour maybe more sunlight than we did up here. Um, they, they, it's really only four hours of sunlight at the darkest day. What that means is it's, um, you know, sun comes up maybe at 1130, goes down at 330 in the afternoon. But what they don't tell you is it's daylight from maybe 10 in the morning until about 430 or 5. Still, it's not enough to maintain a horticulture industry without the lights. But you have geothermal energy that powers the lights and heats the greenhouses. Um, they have their bumblebees that they use as pollinators there in the, 
in the um, uh, greenhouse, and then they use volcanic soil um, for uh, that's really uh, quite nutritious for their um, for their production. They use a lot of vertical crops, as I would say. They are crops that can make use of vertical space. So you can tra tra um, trellis tomatoes, you can trellis cucumbers. They are um, about 100% self-sufficient in um, tomatoes. You can go to the grocery store and you buy Icelandic tomatoes. It has the Icelandic flag on it. Um, they have a lot of salad available year round, Icelandic salad. Um, so it'll be a salad mix. Um, mostly just a standard kind of salad, lettuce salad mix. Um, they're about 60 to 70% self-sufficient in cucumbers and um, about 30 to 40% self-sufficient in, in peppers, um, which is pretty amazing. Again, I said we were in the subarctic, so it's pretty interesting. Um, but you can see there had been a snowstorm right before, and um, these are... Uh, there's a, um, actually, let me just get out of this for just a second and move that over so you can see that the, um, um, there's a lot of greenhouses hooked together. But then you can see that this um, greenhouse, you, there's even bananas growing in this one greenhouse and um, coffee beans. So this is a different kind of constructed one, but they harvest coffee beans in this um, area. They're, they're further over here and bananas and they have all kinds of different kinds of um, um, plants, uh, tropical plants growing there all winter long. Now, this greenhouse is actually uh, a teaching greenhouse and the Agricultural University of Iceland has um, a horticulture program at this particular school and it's about an hour south of where I'm living right now. Um, and the headquarters of the Agricultural University are where I'm at. But this is called Rekish, and it's, um, it's in an area with a lot of hot springs. And um, they have a two-year horticulture pr uh, program there with a high placement with um, area horticulture farms. I was just down in this region, um, I think, uh, 10 days ago, and went to an on-farm market uh, uh, greenhouse on farm market and um, um, we uh, bought strawberries which were quite good um, and um, potted herbs and so on. There are quite a few um, on farm markets especially in areas where um, they might get a lot of tourists. Um, so we don't know what's going to happen this year because of the tourism um, issues with COVID, but it's it's pretty amazing that they can that they can do this. Um, if you guys have any questions, I just feel like I'm kind of talking into a void, of course, as you do on Zoom. Um, just uh, pop in and ask me. So while you might not have expected these the incredible um, greenhouses um, that you that you're seeing in these pictures and you might not have expected that they can produce a lot of tomatoes and so on. Um, you probably expected livestock and of course you expected sheep. And um, we were coming back from the uh, pool um, that we were at, the outdoor pool where the Vikings converted to Christianity. It holds about three people. Um, so you have to take turns when you drive up there. It's down a deserted valley. There's, you know, there's like two cars that'll pass you while you're in the pool for 30 minutes. We were there the other night, um, about 10 days ago on a Friday night. Um, the farmers have just started to turn their lambs out. So as soon as the lambs are born, it's lambing season. They started about May 1st in our area. Um, we are going to head to Northeast Iceland uh, next week. Uh, my, the graduate student I'm working with, she's going home to help with lambing on her brother's farm. And North Iceland will be about a week to two weeks behind. Well, more like two to three weeks behind with lambing um, with spring than down here. So you're really within the Arctic Circle. Um, you're very close to the Arctic Circle when you're up in the um, up in North Iceland. I guess we're I guess we're technically in the Arctic Circle, but you're really close to things up there. The other thing you might not have thought about is horses. 
So I have never seen so many horses running out in the fields as I have here. Um, I uh, there's a lot of really um, interesting parts of the, oops, sorry, um, let me open that. Looks like though goes up with these kinds of production systems. Yanu, let's save that, but that is a definitely, that's a really important question um, about the pricing um, that happens with these things. And food is extremely expensive in Iceland. Um, extremely expensive. I Meat is probably two to three times as, as expensive. I think um, it's even a little bit more expensive than the meat I would buy at the farmer's market. Um, but most of that can be, most of the pricing can also be chalk, chalked up to um, um, import. Uh, it's an island and they have to import a lot of things. So that's where some stuff uh, come, comes up. So that was as it uh, looks like local food price will go up with these kinds of production systems and is it still affordable? Um, yes, uh, Iceland has um, some poverty, but you do not see poverty the same way that you see it in the United States. And that has to do with their social welfare system is quite a lot stronger than in the United States. So back to these horses. Horses are everywhere. Um, they are the only stock that is kept outside all winter long. So you'll be driving and the horses will be out in the snow and the wind and everything. Um, they're smaller horses. Uh, they are, we might in the United States might consider them ponies. Um, they're on the verge of being, being ponies. Uh, but uh, they are a special, um, uh, they have a, most of them have five gates, and so they have a gate that's very fast that people can ride very easily. Um, and there's strong, strong interest in riding horses here in Iceland. A lot of people in rural Iceland um, go out for rides. Um, they sell a lot of horses internationally, but they also eat horse here. Um, they will generally eat um, foals um, when they're about six months old. And um, the other day we had some smoked um, horse sausage um, that is kind of a remnant from when, uh, from traditional foods. Um, and uh, so horse is eaten here, um, which may be kind of weird for Americans and some other folks. But let me say a little bit, these sheep look different and you'll see some other pictures. These horses look different. Everything looks different to me here than the kinds of uh, livestock that you would see in the um, U.S. And part of that is um, these sheep are, I'm always looking at them, I feel like the sheep here are really bug-eyed um, compared to the sheep that we have in the U.S. Um, these particular sheep were not sheared in March. A lot of sheep, you'll see some more, will be sheared in the uh, middle of the winter in March just to make them a little more comfortable in the sheep houses because sheep are almost always left inside all winter long. If they're not inside, they have to have some protection where they can go in and out as they choose. Um, you see that there are a number of different kinds of colors um, in this. There's a lot of Icelandic sheep are very, they will not import any animals because due to um, concerns about disease spreading. So they do not import horses, they do not import sheep, they do not import these animals, but they work with the animals that they have here. And it's really an amazing reservoir of genetic diversity. So that makes it really interesting here um, too. Um, these, uh, I think that this long wool is kind of interesting to me. It looks different to me than like what I'm used to on wool sheep back in the United States. Um, they also have huge horns. These are the rams. And um, those have developed because they will go, remember I said that uninhabitable area of Iceland, they'll send the sheep up there usually in the summer. Um, and so the, the ewes and the rams get these huge horns. Um, they'll bring them down during the, um, um, sometime in the fall. And they'll have a central spot like like this is on um, one of the peninsulas, the Vatnes Peninsula. 
and they'll have a central spot where they will drive the sheep that they bring down from the highlands in and then they'll sort them according to the farm number they'll sort them into in these big sheep short sorting areas so i think those are kind of cool unfortunately i won't be here to, to see that part um uh this is just another picture of these sheep some of these sheep they call leader sheep and we were at my this was just taken last night um, this, this you had triplets and, um, she was way out back here. If you can see where my cursor is and we were just there to, to see my friend, um, uh, Ragenhilder and she, there were other sheep around here, but she comes all the way up and she comes, she acted like she was just going to come up to me and, and, um, um, you know, like, Oh, do you have food or something? No, she gets about three feet away from me and she looks at me and she glares at me and she stomps her feet and then she puts her head down like she's going to charge me. And uh, she is the boss, you, and she's also probably what they call a leader sheep. And these sheep are generally more alert and they are the ones that the farmers here feel like they protect them, um, protect the other sheep when they go up to the... Um, um, up to the highlands. So Holly has another question and Holly, I want you, I'm going to answer that in a little bit because Iceland is way fascinating, but it's not the place I ever thought I was going to be going. This is another picture just a few days ago. Spring has been very slow coming. It's been cold at night. Um, it's a little dry, so they're worried about that, but the sheep are out on, um, on the pastures. Uh, one way they judge if the if the pasture is providing enough food for them is if they come up back to the buildings um, to eat hay. And my friend Reigenhilder, who has this sheep, and you can see all the hay bales back here, um, plastic hay bales. So plastic is waste there. <coughs> they, um, uh, she says the sheep are still coming up and eating all the time, so that means there's not a lot of grass out there yet. Um, so in March, uh, these are agriculture students um, at the Agriculture University. The Agriculture University has kind of two tracks. There is a um, vocational track, and that vocational track is uh, one or two years, depending um, if you've had further education or not. Um, so like this guy standing back here, this uh, uh, taller guy um, back here talking to the lady. He has a bachelor's degree in agriculture, but then decided that he needed to learn the practical side. So he's spending a year doing practical vocational training. Um, and he's from a farm and might go back to the farm, but he has a bachelor's from agriculture university. So they'll shear, they learn how to shear, they learn how to do a lot of different things in that vocational um, track. They will go out and work on a farm for, um, um, I think they're out right now for like six months, five months. They'll come back in the fall for their second year. Um, this is just a traditional uh, farmhouse. Um, this house was built in the teens. Um, and so uh, uh, I find their housing very interesting, but this would have housed a farmer with a very large family um, at that point in time. And Iceland sometimes, um, it was very impoverished due to the Danish crown and, you know, they had a, they had a um, eruption, a volcanic eruption in the late 1700s that wiped out 80% of their livestock and 20% of their population. And they call it kind of the hunger times. So they had a hard time kind of recovering from that. You didn't really even have villages. You had farms where there would be, you know, a fair number of people living on the farms, but really no villages, um, which was hard for me to get at. Um, oh, was that the, no, I have some more, I thought. Nope, that was it. I had an, um, a dairy picture. Where was the dairy picture? And I talked about it. Okay, so that is, that is where I'm, I'm going to stop. Now, we had some um, questions. What made me want to go to Iceland and study food systems? Why would I come someplace like this? Um, and what was appealing or interesting about Iceland in particular? So let me just tell you, I'm on a Fulbright. I was. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. <clears throat> I was on a Fulbright um, um, 
Scholar uh, project. So Fulbright scholars can um, apply to have a Fulbright to um, do research in another country or maybe to teach in another country. And sometimes they're designed by the scholar and sometimes they're designed by the country. And Iceland, uh, Agricultural University of Iceland, had decided to advertise for a scholar who wanted to teach sustainable agriculture and with more of the social and economic emphasis. And my friend found this announcement and said, you should apply. And so I'm like, oh, yeah, maybe I should. And that's how I ended up in Iceland. And it probably would not have been my first um, uh, I didn't really know much about Iceland besides it being a Nordic country, but I tell you, it's an amazing place. Um, people are wonderful here. It's a beautiful place. Um, it's a, uh, they like to say that they've got one foot on the North American um, uh, continent because the North American plate and the, the Eurasian plate actually meet here. Um, in the place where they held their parliament, which has been pretty much held for like a thousand years in the same place. Um, and uh, they, they are kind of American and kind of Nordic. So it's a very interesting, interesting place to be. Other questions about anything that I've um, talked about? I don't know, Yanni, if I answered your question or not. And you guys can unmute and just ask questions, can't you? You don't have to type them. Yeah, they should be able to unmute, but if for some reason you're not able to, um, use one of the reactions, and Lindsay or I will unmute you so that you can speak. You're also welcome to put your videos on as well. Yeah, I can see you again. Yay! <laughs> Mary, this this is Ann Deaton, and I have to apologize. Brady and I were trying so hard to get on, um, in a timely way he still may be trying but Lindsay <laughs> Lindsay sent me something just a moment ago that um, enabled me to get on I don't know we haven't had problems before but we did this time and anyway, oh, no. I, I can't thank you enough I'm just so sorry that I didn't hear all of this so here comes Brady I guess he never got on on his computer so he's back here um, but we're so sorry we we missed this but so uh, you know, so in, in, impressed that you that you went there, and and I guess I would like to to know from that experience, um, you know, what surprised you most? What was a highlight of that experience for you? And what were things that you brought back here and integrated into your work here? So I'm still here, Anne. I'm still in Iceland, um, which is kind of cool, and. Um, I think one of the things that surprises me the most isn't particularly related to um, food and agriculture, but it has a bearing on it. Um, and that is, is that this tiny place, 365,000 people, 364,200 actually, something like that, maintains 800 miles of road. And okay, it's not uh, it's not a fabulous interstate highway system like we have, but 800 miles of road. They have um, University of Iceland is a world class university, um, but they have a strong university system that they try to disperse uh, across uh, the country to make sure that uh, every part of the country is represented. Um, people are really educated here, um, and a lot of people travel to other Nordic nations to to um, pursue um, master's degrees or or go to college there. Um, even if the jobs, um, sometimes they're not working in jobs that they really totally use their education. And then they have a really good healthcare system, and I think the healthcare system, it, the the idea behind the healthcare system is. Perhaps most intriguing, I don't know if you guys have been following the news, but Iceland is, um, they tested um, widely and early. They um, had a really high rate of confirmed infections of COVID, but pro probably that's because they tested over 10% of their population. Um, they tracked, isolated, quarantined. Um, they had 10 deaths here, which is about 2.7 people per 100,000, which is, 
is um, a tenth of what the United States has had. Um, they did that because when people were sick, they mobilized their uh, contact tracing team and their medical teams to call everybody that had been confirmed with an infection. They called them every day, twice a day. Wow. If the symptoms were getting worse, they called them more often. If they thought they were getting worse, they came to their house and then they put them in um, the hospital. So they had a fairly low rate of hospitalization. They've had a fairly low rate of death. They have managed, they did have some outbreaks in nursing homes, but they've managed to um, take care of them pretty well. Well, why am I interested in that? That's the infrastructure that a country of 364,000 people can put together. They don't have a military. They're strategically important. They don't have a military. They've never had a military. Denmark was their military. The NATO is their military. And I think it just speaks to what kinds of things you can do if you spend your money on, on, um, on health and education infrastructure. So I think that that's part of the thing that really surprised me the most. Um, there are things that they do, like they do a lot of tillage, and so that's been interesting um, here. They don't feel like they can uh, uh, do no-till. They don't like the, they say, well, you guys do no-till in the United States, but it's you don't um, uh, use your, uh, we don't use as many chemicals as you do. And then finally, the agriculture thing that surprised me the most and I'm going to have coffee with a woman who was involved in this early on, um, is they, have, um, they don't have farmer's markets at all. They have a, some on-farm sales. Um, they, there's a lot of farmers that have to participate, they, that rural people participate in the handicrafts um, economy because that, uh, they sell a lot of things to tourists. So you will have on-farm shops that way. But what they do have is something they called Reiko. And Reiko comes out of um, Sweden. And they, everybody in Iceland's on Facebook. Like, I don't know, it's 95% of the population is on Facebook. But nobody uses Facebook for political reasons. Like, there are no political posts, or hardly any. It's pictures of their kids. It's pictures of celebrations. It's that kind of thing. But everybody's on Facebook. So Reiko uses Facebook groups, and they say, okay, we're going to have Reiko West Westerland, which is where I'm at. We're going to meet in Akernes on February 20th, and if here are the farmers that are going to bring product. You need to order, so you just go on that Facebook page, you contact that farmer, you, um, they, you know, they have a list of what they're going to have, you contact that farmer, um, they specify a drop-off point, you go to that drop-off point, Everything's been done. You paid for it electronically because as soon as you know your social security number here, then life is uh, your financial life is lived online. <laughs> uh, you know, I've, I mean, I have maybe had um, one hundred dollars in my in cash in my hand the entire time we've lived here because yeah. everything is online with the banking system. So this, they really cut down on a lot of costs by going through that RACO and it's really an interesting uh, thing. And I'm hoping to do some more interviews with farmers. I haven't been able to do stuff because of COVID and I can just now get back out to, the country opened up on May 4th, so now we can go back out. Yeah, I don't know if that answered you, Ian. No, it did. And Mary, I should tell you, you, um, you might be interested to know that at least here in Columbia, Boone County, because of COVID-19, they actually uh, had to move to something like that. So people can go online and on our local farmer's market here, you order everything, you do everything online. And when you get there and you drive up, they hand you what you ordered. <laughs> so fewer people are actually physically walking at farmer's market. Um, so that's a kind of version of that that they came to from necessity. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I've been following that in the U.S. too. It's fascinating. I have a not serious question. Um, well, I actually have two questions. One, with COVID-19, 
when will you be back in the United States? Does that affect anything that you are currently doing? And the second question is, what has been your favorite food dish from your time in Iceland? <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll answer the second part first. Um, um, what the, there's a lot of favorite foods, but I really like, they do waffles and pancakes really well here. And they have a tradition when you can see the sun, when the sun comes over the mountains, they make what they call sun pancakes. So here at this university, they, um, a, a, one of the staff members, she, they're, they're thin, they're almost like crepes. And um, you, she made sun pancakes for all of us um, in the end of January. And you just have, um, you put rhubarb sauce on them, which is kind of a runny rhubarb jam and um, lots of whipped cream. And um, that's one of my favorite foods here. Um, and then ice cream, Icelanders love ice cream. I don't eat very much of it, but it's, um, it's really good. And uh, they have a product called Traditional Skeeter, which is um, very much like Quark. If you've been to the farmer's market and had the Quark from the Hemi Brothers, um, but it's kind of like a fresh, soft cheese that's crossed between cream cheese and yogurt. Um, what was your other question about COVID? Oh, when am I coming back? Um, so I was actually, I'm actually here. I'm kind of a resistor being here. <laughs> Um, Fulbright recalled all American Fulbrighters um, in March and said we had to come home. And if we didn't come home, we were private citizens and on our own and we were Fulbright alumni. And so um, luckily the University of Missouri, uh, I didn't want to come home at that point because I didn't want to travel and get COVID. And I felt like the situation was very well managed here and I was in a rural area and people were taking it very seriously here. So I didn't want to travel. So I decided to stay and it, it was, it's been a little bit nerve wracking because the embassy sends these announcements like you need to come home. We're not going to repatriate you. You need to get the next flight out. But Iceland Air has been flying two flights a week to Boston now, and they just confirmed they will be, the government will support them flying through the end of June because Iceland Air is in bad shape financially, like a lot of airlines, and um, the international airport here had a reduction of 99.3% between April of 2019 and April of 2020. Mm -hmm. um, this country depends, a third of the country depends on tourism. A third of the economy depends on tourism and even in rural areas. And so it's, it's gonna, it's, it's serious for them. But I decided I'm gonna, um, my tickets are for June 29th, but we'll probably come home on what the June 27th date or something. But I feel a little bit more relieved that we'll be getting home at the end of June. Um, but I, um, the university said I could stay, that I was covered. Um, I didn't want to travel in a level four global pandemic. Um, so they said, well, since you didn't travel there, you don't have to travel, you'll be, you'll be okay. So there are about, apparently about 600 Fulbrighter, American Fulbrighters around the world that decided not to, not to leave. And there were a bunch of graduate students here in Iceland that decided not to go home. And Part of that, and I know I have a lot of international students on, but part of that decision was predicated on the fact that they had been in Iceland long enough, six months, that they were enrolled in the National Health Service here, and they had health insurance. So if they went back, they wouldn't have health insurance because they, had, they, they didn't have jobs. They didn't have, you know, this was their job. So um, I think that that's been a really interesting part of, of this. So. That's kind of a serious answer there. <laughs> I think you did the right thing by delaying your return. <laughs> well, thanks, Anne. We, we feel like it, but it was like a little nerve wracking when the embassy, I had written to the embassy people and said, well, I'm assuming there's gonna be flights in June, so I'm staying. I have a place to stay. I have the money to stay, so I'm staying. And they didn't, you know, they didn't, Jerry Gillis said, oh, the email you got back from them, that's not threatening. Don't worry, you can stay. <laughs> <laughs>
Mary, I, I would put us on video, but I'm a casualty of this whole shelter in place and I'm still in my bathrobe. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, you just get busy working, right? <laughs> right, right. I, I've been on Zoom since early this morning. <laughs> hi, hi, Mary. Can I join in here for a moment? Sure. I really enjoyed your, your commentary about the uh, the way in which the country is operating its infrastructure. And I found that I, I worked uh, for a while, uh, several weeks, uh, by that I mean over a couple, three years in Grenada, which is a, a nation of an island, but an island nation of about 50 some thousand people. And it was one of the most, it's one of the most sophisticated economies I've ever seen, you know, with its own central banking system and its ambassadors everything you can think of as a nation it has it it has it in a way you can get your hands around it <laughs> and you can really understand the, some of the complexities of larger societies by really seeing how how it functions in a place that's more manageable to observe so i was taken by your comments there about the infrastructure and i was going to ask you about their taxing system for generating the revenue for public expenditures so I haven't delved deep into that, um, and they have, they, of course, um, not everything's rosy. Um, the, they're overcrowded in Reykjavik in the, in the capital region. They, a lot of rural people, because I'm in, I'm about an hour from Reykjavik, and um, about um, um, in a, the town closest i'm in a town of 300 people which is where the agriculture university is and then organized has about 2500 people but you know it's pretty it's pretty isolated up here um mm. and we're close to the capital region so we're not nearly as isolated as say the west fjords or something like that um and there are significant concerns i met with the rural development officer here and there's significant concerns about rural development there's significant tensions with the urban population over food production. Um, the uh, agricultural policy does have um, um, a bias towards like supporting livestock production and the environmentalists think that uh, the sheep are bad for the grazing and so on. So there's a lot of tension there about the food prices and couldn't we import it and have better food prices and stuff like that. And apparently, what I've heard, I don't know for sure, um, but just John has talked to some people and so on. The salary structure is pretty flat. So you can be working a long time in a place and you're not going to be making that much more than a person that um, starts there. So, you know, the, the salary is, is pretty flat. And so, you know, but they, but they, there's a lot of social trust here. So it doesn't seem like people resent that too much. Um, and I think the minimum, I think the minimum, they don't have a minimum wage, but in general, I think they kind of have like a, a target, minimum target uh, household income. And so that is, that ends up being like $14, $15 an hour, something in there. So uh, wages are pretty, ex you know, it's an expensive place to live. Housing is it's expensive, um, but you know, cars are expensive, but people don't have to pay for health care. They don't have to pay for education in the same way. So it seems like it works pretty well here. Um, and uh, we just don't see like, I mean, they work, they work more hours here than they do in the other Nordic countries. That is true. And there's a lot of people that string together several part-time jobs. So, you know, it's not all rosy, but it seems like it works pretty well. I'd understood that Iceland had developed some innovative uh, fish drying tech technologies and systems. Are, have you run into that at all? No, because Akureyri, the University of Akureyri is where all the fish uh, research oh, okay. is, and that's up north. Okay. Um, one of the fish guys that's here, he is more, you know, there's a lot of salmon farming and stuff like that here, just like in Norway. And that creates a lot of tension too, because um, um, 
uh, fishing licensing for your rivers because a lot of people, their land abuts uh, waterways and then they control the waterway. Uh, once it's in from the fjord in inland, whoever owns the land owns that waterway. Um, mm -hmm. And they, they get to, um, they sell a lot of fishing licenses for um, catching fish. Um, the old way of drying fish was really, um, um, you know, it was just dried. And so I don't know. I would assume that the innovative ways probably rely on a lot of the geothermal work that, that they've done. Their geothermal industry is just amazing. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Holly, you asked me about my favorite food. Well, let me tell you the food that I didn't like. <laughs> so they have a tradition here. Um, the, the, the party during the month of Thor, the old month of Thor, which is the winter month. And um, they eat all the traditional, they do it by neighborhood. So we got to go to one um, Thor lot and uh, they have uh, sheep testicles, um, boiled sheep head, um, oh. whale, whale um, or, or shark, a fermented shark. Um, which people love, but I didn't like dried fish with butter. Um, but then they have some other things, but they eat the old foods and a lot of the ways that they preserve foods up through the, you know, through the 20th century was, um, soured in whey, right? Um, so they ate a lot of fish, you know, a lot of fresh food and a lot of stuff that was, um, you know, fermented or, or pickled in, in, in whey. And so uh, uh, some of those foods I'm not so concerned about. Uh, sheep's head is actually not bad, but um, uh, the shark and stuff like that I'm not the was not not so good. And the whale was terrible. <laughs> I'm impressed that you tried it, Mary. Good job. We tried. We tried it all. Um, I didn't eat the testicles because I said, "Look, I've I it's won't eat somewhere." I won't eat cheap testicles in the U S either. And I've, you know, I've, I've been around a plenty of, um, um, of, uh, Rocky mountain oysters. <laughs> I just, I wanted to say, Mary, I know we're about out of time, but, um, I was very impressed that they had tropical agriculture at the university there and <laughs> samples in the greenhouse. I mean, we're much closer to the tropics and yet we, um, really don't have that much, like we have um, a group of chocolate researchers, but not a cacao plant to be seen. <laughs> but I think that they just grow that to say that they can grow it. And, and, you know, they'll grind coffee from it and stuff like that. But it's, it's more of a production trick for, you know, the real production and the research is on the tomatoes, the cucumbers, and the peppers. And what I don't understand is, I don't understand why they don't grow more greens, different kinds of greens um, in the greenhouses. And uh, something I'm going to talk to the rural development officer about, because I think it's a researchable question, is um, uh, the horticulture people didn't get as much of the government policy payouts as like the sheep guys or the dairy guys. And so um, the government is part of their aid package due to COVID is um, um, supporting horticulture more, but they want... I think it, I think you, in order to um, get the money, as I understand it, it, you have to increase your production by 25%. So what they're going to do is to increase more self production in Iceland. So I'm really interested in this. Um, and I'm going to talk to the rural development guy has a survey going out and, and he's an economist, um, Brady. He uh, is a spatial economist though. So he's more like, wow, okay. and, um, He's got a survey going out in September, and I'm thinking, oh, wouldn't this be interesting to try to look at rural wealth with that? So um, yeah. that just that, they just announced that new um, um, package. And some of my other students were pretty upset with the left. It's a left green coalition that's the ruling coalition. Um, they say that there's too much emphasis on on you know innovative stars and not enough on transformational transformational policies so that's been pretty interesting yeah. I'm sorry, Brady, you were going to say something 
Mary, just quickly, because I, I know we are out of time. Um, is the picture we're looking at of that building, is that where you live or teach? Or no, that is, that, that's a friend of John's from Car Club. That's, it's just a typical farmhouse out in um, okay. on the Snifleness. Um, I actually didn't put any pictures in of my university. I'm sorry. I live in the, a student apartment. Um, so John and I were locked down during COVID in a one-bedroom apartment. So oh. I survived. <laughs> well, beautiful pictures. I'm just yeah, there now. Thank you. Yeah, there's so these are the greenhouses that uh, Lindsay was saying. So there's so a lot. Where, so Mary, where's the front door of the house? The front door of the house from um, is actually on the other side, and um, it, it's actually um, let me think. Oh yeah, it's over here to the left, um, and then there's. There basically this part down here is there was a kitchen down there and um, bathrooms. They but there's also a kitchen up in this corner as well. But when this was this is a house that like, they probably would have had um, hired men and lots of visitors. They said so. I mean, it sounds like there could be like 15 people living in these houses during the. Um, during various points of the years when in the, in these rural houses, because Iceland also had quite a quite large families for quite a while. They still have large families. I think, you know, everybody here has like three or more kids. It seems like, um, so I, I feel like it's larger families too. So that uh, on this side, Sharon, it would have been a, over here on this side. And, um, uh, this would be the living room area. And then there's like five bedrooms up here that are tiny plus one bathroom there. So, thanks. <laughs> well, take care thanks. of yourself and be safe. Well, thank you. We're going to go vacationing around the around the island next week for ten days. So, oh, enjoy. Yeah. Thanks. Does anyone else have any questions that they would like to ask um, before we wrap up today? Cool. Okay. Um, right, perfect. I had one question, but I honestly forgot what it was. <laughs> oh, I know what it was actually. So if you were to stay in Iceland for longer, say like another year, five years, what would be a topic that you think would be really interesting to study more in depth in Iceland? So I am really interested in these um, local, like how you think about local food systems and sustainability in such a harsh climate. And then also what is like the climate change is having pretty significant impacts. So the glaciers are, are retreating. Um, um, there, the, you know, there's some really interesting things like that uh, um, going on. So that part I would study. And then I'm really interested in this, how food can be part of rural development again, given the tensions with the urban areas. Um, so all of those kinds of things um, make it really interesting. And then Brady might be interested in this, but the because of the university system is much like European university systems, so they'll go through a stronger college prep program before they come to university. But there are no social science courses. There's one natural resource economics class that's offered. For people that are getting a bachelor's in agriculture or a bachelor's in environmental sciences, they don't oh, have sociology or history or um, anything. I was telling them about how we have like uh, three credits in humanities, three credits in social sciences, three credits in natural sciences, um, you know, three classes or three classes, I should say, nine hours. They don't have that. Um, so it's a little bit easier. I mean, they're well read and they're, I think the college prep does better, but there's not a lot of interdisciplinary work at the, you know, at the college level, which I thought yeah. was interesting. Dude, what is their uh, experience of going on to graduate school after college? There, they, a lot of them go on to grad school and, um, um, uh, so this agriculture university is actually a lot of them are distance learning. So um, I had maybe eight people in class, but then I would have people like the other 10 would be on 
I would record the lectures that we did during class and they would be online and they come in in weeks three and six um, during an eight week period. They'll come on campus during that time. But a lot of the people, some of the people in my class were um, masters. So they were getting a master's in environmental science after they've you know, done an agriculture degree or they might have done a computer technology degree and decided now to go back, you know, there's a lot of non-traditional students, there's a lot of parents because they have pretty cheap student housing, so it's good for parents with small children here. Oh. Um, so there's a lot of highly educated people, probably more education than the jobs actually need, but it's, you know, people just really believe in education here. Yeah. Well, that's fascinating. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to go home and have supper. <laughs> thank you so yeah. much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. That was great. Yeah, thanks, Mary. It was fun. All right. Fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Have a good dinner. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mary. <laughs> Thanks.